All right, so good morning. On behalf of the board of the Arendt Center, welcome to BARD. Uh, that sentence represents about a third of my responsibilities this morning. Um, Roger Berkowitz, uh, director of the Arendt Center, asked me to offer a brief and non-academic point of view on why the conference and the center uh, are important. Uh, for context, I'm qualified uh, to offer that because I am not an academic. Uh, my name is Dean Hakamovich. Uh, after getting a degree in mathematics from another four-year institution, uh, I skipped graduate school uh, to work in the tech industry 20-something years ago. Uh, I joined the board of the Arendt Center a few years ago. Uh, it was, to use lingo for my industry, a no-brainer. Um, today, it is easier than ever before to tune out, to filter points of view, uh, or even facts that don't fit your worldview or your preferred narrative. It's so easy to dismiss someone uh, based on profiling. Uh, oh, they were on Fox, they were on NPR, uh, they're part of Occupy Wall Street, uh, they're, they're a tea partier, they are a knuckle-dragging paleo-libertarian. Uh, it's so easy to reduce information with a set of litmus tests. Are you for or against charter schools? Are you for school shootings? Are you against the Constitution and the Second Amendment? Uh, Citizens United, uh, Iraq, intervention in Syria, Trayvon Martin, Ferguson, American exceptionalism. Uh, the long list of issues that we have available to divide us. The Arendt Center and its conferences offer an alternative. Actually read, actually listen, understand and discuss rather than filter and dismiss. When Roger told me the books and speakers uh, for, for this conference, I was surprised at how quickly I put speakers into boxes. Oh wait, wasn't that the guy who, and then, uh, I judged based on what others had said about them instead of their actual work. I hope that today uh, you can consider the ideas you hear on their own merits rather than uh, based on stereotypes or profiling of the speakers. Now, with that, I'd like to ask Bard student Imani Jones uh, to the stage. Uh, each day's program uh, will start and end with a poem about America, the first poem is America by Walt Whitman. Uh, Imani will read it now. Center of equal daughters, equal sons, all, all alike, endeared, grown, ungrown, young or old, strong, ample, fair, enduring, capable, rich, perennial with the earth, with freedom, law and love, a grand, sane, towering, seated mother, chaired in the adamant of time. Now, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Roger Berkowitz. He is Associate Professor of Political Studies and Human Rights here at Bard, as well as the Academic Director of the Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities. He's the author of the book, The Gift of Science, Leibniz and the Modern Legal Tradition, as well as co-editor of several collections. Please welcome Roger to the podium. Thank you, Dean, and, and, and welcome all of you to uh, what I hope will be, and I'm confident will be, uh, a really exciting uh, two days. Uh, I wanna take a little time just at the beginning to uh, introduce you to the conference, explain a little bit about what I was thinking about uh, when, when, I, when I came up with the topic, and, uh, and, and, and provide just some, some guidelines for what we're gonna do for the next couple days. About a, a year ago, one of those weird confluences happened in my life where a number of books I was reading at the same time uh, coalesced around a, a topic or a question. So uh, first, 
uh, I picked up a book uh, that some of you may have known uh, by Lawrence Lessig, Republic Lost. And in the beginning of that book, Les Mr. Lessig writes, Professor Lessig writes, there is a feeling today among too many Americans that we might not make it, that the end is near, or that doom is around the corner, but that a distinctly American feeling of an inevitability, of greatness, culturally, economically, politically, is gone. That the thing that we were once most proud of, this, our republic, is the one thing that we have all learned to ignore. Government is an embarrassment. It has lost the capacity to make the most essential decisions. And slowly it begins to dawn upon us, a ship that cannot be steered is a ship that is sinking. So that, was, that book came out in 2011. Can you hear me on this one? I, I, I read it. And shortly after that, I read this book, which came out in 2012 by Charles Murray. And in the introduction to this book, Mr. Murray writes, this book is about an evolution in American society that has taken place since November 21st, 1963, a day that many of you will know, leading to the formation of classes that are different in kind and in their degree of separation from anything that the nation has ever known. I will argue that the divergence into these separate classes, if it continues, will end what has made America, America. And then shortly after this, I read a book that came out in 2013 by George Packer, The Unwinding. The unwinding is nothing new. There have been unwindings every generation or two. The fall to the earth of the founder's heavenly republic in a noisy marketplace of quarrelsome factions. The war that tore the United States apart and turned them from plural to singular. The crash that laid waste to the business of America, making way for a democracy of bureaucrats and everyman. Each decline brought renewal. Each implosion released energy. Out of each unwinding came a new cohesion. So these three books were uh, all in a very important way, start with this assumption that there is something meaningful, exceptional about America, and that that is being lost, republic lost, the unwinding, it's being unwound, it's coming apart. And I thought, first of all, I agreed with this uh, assumption, with this argument, and uh, I thought that these three speakers um, would be the nucleus of what could be a, a spectacular and interesting conversation about both what was great America, about America, how and why it's coming unwound and undone and apart, and um, what we could do about it. And so that's why we're here uh, for the next two days to have that conversation. Let me begin by suggesting that this, some people say, oh, well, there is no American exceptionalism. That's a myth. It's a fiction. It doesn't really happen. And, 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 and there's always going to be some of that. I, I don't want to ignore that. But let me at least give you a little bit of background and just take you through a, a history that makes the case in some way that there is something unique and exceptional about America and go back in our history. So uh, this is John Winthrop, uh, who came over on the Arabelle uh, with the Pilgrims and landed in, and was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And in the famous sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, from 1630, he uttered these lines, for we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work, we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. This, this speech was, you know, um, printed, first printed in 1838, so a fair bit later, but it obviously was the foundation for John F. Kennedy's City Upon a Hill speech uh, in, in 1961. The argument is that America was this new beginning in the eyes of God that could be an example for the world. And this idea that Winthrop planted lasted. So Thomas Paine, in his book Common Sense in 1776, he writes, we have every opportunity and every encouragement before us 
to form the noblest, purest constitution on the face of the earth. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah until now. The birthday of a new world is at hand, and a race of men, perhaps as numerous as all Europe contains, are to receive their portion of freedom from the ever, from the event of a few months. So here we have a secular, Thomas Paine was a, a, a raging atheist, uh, hard, far from the religion of, of John Winthrop as you get, but who takes that same idea. Philip Freneau, who's, a, who's called the poet of the American Revolution, uh, takes pain and turns it into verse. So shall our nation, formed on virtue's plan, remain the guardian of the rights of man, a vast republic famed through every clime without a kind to see the end of time. And then, uh, as some of you know, in 1829, Alexis de Tocqueville from France comes to America and in 1835 publishes volume one of um, Democracy in America. And in it, he famously writes, the situation of Americans is therefore entirely exceptional, and it is to be believed that no other democratic people will ever be placed in it. So once again, another claim of exceptionalism. And then probably the, one of the most powerful, Abraham Lincoln, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we have highly resolved, here highly resolved, that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. Once again, the argument is made that America is a city on the hill, a model, a model for others, and thus an exceptional model. Um, in 1935, uh, Langston Hughes writes uh, a poem, which you'll hear later today, again by Imani, uh, so we'll get to hear that, uh, in which one of the, the key verses and the refrain is, let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. And we see here, the, the, not only the, not the beginning, because throughout American history, this dream of American exceptionalism was used not only by those in power to justify America, which it was, but also by many out of power in America to call America back to its highest and best ideals. And then, of course, that dream uh, becomes the foundation of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, I say to you today, my friends. I'm sorry, I'm not going to speak it like him. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. So this was just a little journey through uh, some American history to show the, the constancy of this idea. It's used by very many different people. Uh, but this idea that America is called to justice, called to equality, called to individualism, called to liberty, because of something about America, because of its unique place in the world. Um, something we might want to call American exceptionalism, which can be used to mean better than, but doesn't have to be. It can also be used to mean different than, unique. Uh, and, and both of those uh, terms, I think, are, are captured in ways that are important. In the same year that Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech, Hannah Arendt uh, published her book on revolution. 1963. And in that book, uh, she writes about America. This is her, in a sense, uh, um, Hannah Arendt uh, escaped from Nazi Germany, uh, escaped one detention camp, escaped arrest, came to America, and fell in love with America. Um, she was uh, a deeply American thinker uh, in, her, in her life and worldview. 
That doesn't mean she wasn't critical of it. She was highly critical of it, but she embraced it. And she writes this book on revolution, which is about the uniqueness of the American Revolution in the history of, the, of revolutions and the uniqueness of the American constitutional democratic system. And she begins by saying that there's a difference between rebellion and liberation. While liberation, um, while the end, the end of rebellion is liberation. So if you think about the Middle East these days, you, you overthrow a dictator, that's rebellion and you liberate yourself from the dictator. But the end of a revolution is the foundation of freedom. And that's much harder, much more difficult. The core to what makes America exceptional and unique for Hannah Arendt is our constitutional tradition. And she writes this, for in America, the armed uprising of the colonies and the Declaration of Independence had been followed by a spontaneous outbreak of constitution making in all 13 colonies. As though, in John Adams' words, 13 clocks had struck as one, so that there existed no gap, no hiatus, hardly a breathing spell between the War of Liberation, which was the condition for freedom, and the Constitution of the new states. Her argument here is that as soon as the revolution happened, all 13 colonies immediately <laughs> remade their constitutions. They didn't... Uh, you know, start just with legislatures. They didn't start passing laws. They said, who are we? What do we believe our politics about? How do we give ourselves the power to rule? And it was this, this practice that started with the Mayflower Compact where people came over, they went off course from Virginia to Boston, to Plymouth Rock, and they got there and said, all right, who's, what's the government? We only have, a, we only have a, a letter from the king for Virginia. Now we're in, in Plymouth. And they said, all right, we are going to give ourselves a government. And she said, this tradition of Americans from nothing, feeling they have the right to give themselves government, to constitute themselves, is at the very core of what makes America unique and special. And she quotes Thomas Paine from The Rights of Man, who offers a definition of a constitution which is very different than we hear today. We think of today, if you teach law, go to law school, or even in the popular press, we think of a constitution as a limit. It says what you can't do, right? The Constitution you know, says the government can't do this. Thomas Paine said the Constitution is a verb. A Constitution is not the act of a government, but of a people constituting a government. It's, it's the act of making. It's the act of constituting ourselves. And Arendt takes this incredibly seriously. It says that this is what really was at the center of the American experience of freedom. And she says that it, it forms what she calls a new system of power, a whole new idea of power. She says the aim of the state constitutions after the revolution was to, quote, create new centers of power after the Declaration of Independence had abolished the authority and power of crown and parliament. So we think of power often as something bad that needs to be eliminated, right? Power, you know, corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Arendt said... Power is good. Power is what people do when they act together for some common end. Power is acting together for, you know, in, in some kind of civic purpose. And what the American response to the revolution was, was to create lots of new centers of power. Constitutions in all 13 states, but also town councils, town governments, nonprofits, uh, non-governmental organizations, all sorts of places which were all became locuses of power. And that's important. And it's important, she says, because power, contrary to what we are inclined to think, cannot be checked, at least reliably, by laws. This is one of the most important insights, and it's one that we just don't understand today. We think that laws and the Constitution can check power. It doesn't work that way, right? If the people in a democracy really want to do something, in the end, they will do it. Laws and constitutions, they, they, have, they, they can serve as some sort of a, a break, and they're important. I'm not saying they're not. But in the end, what Arun says is, and you, know, you have to understand, her experience is coming out of Weimar, right, where this has just happened. But um, the, what she says is that John Adams and the American revolutionaries were convinced that power must be opposed to power, force to force, strength to strength, not laws and just pieces of paper. 
And so what the Americans did is they created this new idea of power, which was to act together in concert, which is also the name of freedom. Not the states ought to surrender their powers to the national government, right? We don't, we had the Articles of Confederation, things were too weak. We don't say states, bad, surrender your power, make the federal government stronger. We make the federal government strong as a balance to the states. Rather, the powers of the central government should be greatly enlarged. Clearly, the true objective of the American Constitution was not to limit power, but to create more power. And this, as she says, is what's different from France and from almost all other modern governments that seek to centralize power and bring power towards the middle as opposed to multiplying the sources of power throughout society. The American Revolution, she says, brought the new American idea of power and the American experience of power out into the open. And the American Revolution, this is Alexis de Tocqueville, who she's quoting here, as it broke out and the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people came out of the townships and took possession of the state. Her point is that it was this American experience of self-government in the townships, on the Arabelle, on the ships, this feeling of right to make our own government, which created uh, a particularly unique American idea of power, which could protect, not only protect freedom, but was what freedom was, because freedom meant self-government. And so she concludes, the great, and in the long run, perhaps the greatest American innovation in politics as such was the consistent abolition of sovereignty within the body politics of the republic. The insight that in the realm of human affairs, sovereignty and tyranny are the, are the same, right? What it made America unique for her is that there was no one sovereign. There was no one place where sovereignty was held. There were many, many, many power sources. It wasn't even the people or the nation because there were many peoples and many nations and each one could have power. It seems like a pretty happy story. Um, but as most of you know who read Arendt, she's not always ending so happy. Uh, the last chapter of the book is called The Lost Treasure, right, of the Revolution. And she talks about how Thomas Jefferson was the founder who most understood the failure of the Constitution. And in, Jeff in, in Jefferson's telling, the failure of the Constitution was that there, it had failed to provide, it failed to give freedom to the people had failed to provide a space where this freedom could be exercised. We had legislators at the federal government, and we had legislators at legislatures at the state level and at the county level, and we had mayors, but we didn't have places where the people would come together and experience the freedom of acting together in self-government. We didn't, we, we let go of the town councils. Jefferson had a proposal for wards, breaking the county into wards, and having each ward be self-government. And the failure of the Constitution to include that low level, that local level for Jefferson of politics led in Arendt's telling to the loss of the treasure, the loss of this multiplication of powers. Because what happened? In big legislatures, in states, and in big administrative bodies, and in the federal government, the people had no experience of power. So what did they do? They let the governors govern. And as the governors govern, the people say, it's not my responsibility. All I have to do is vote every couple of years. The people get corrupted. And so Aaron says, what we see in America is the corruption of the people. What could happen, and what indeed has happened over and over again since, was that the representative organs should become corrupt and perverted. But such corruption was not likely to be due, and hardly ever has been due, to a conspiracy of the, repre conspiracy of the representative organs against the people whom they represented. Corruption in this kind of government is much more likely to spring from the midst of society, that is, from the people themselves. The people become convinced that the government's just there to serve them. So they buy the government, or they expect services from the government, but they stop governing. And that was the ultimate corruption, right? Um, Zephyr Teachout, who's gonna to speak tomorrow, primarily, also a little today, writes a lot about the corruption of the people in her new book. 
I want to provide one quick example of what I have to mean, what I mean by this. And this is a book probably very few of you know. It came out in 1958. It's called Small Town and Mass Society. And it's a study, actually, of a little town, Cander, interestingly named, uh, Cander, New York, not near Ithaca. And um, in the book, it, asks, it studies these small town people in the 1950s. And it finds that these people all think of themselves as superior to urban dwellers. Right? They're the, they're the sort of root of America. They're the independent. They, they're, not, you know, they're not so big. They have, they have their own little ways. They're good folk, they call themselves, right? And they also can govern themselves in a small town, good American fashion. But as the writers study the people and study the town and the politics, what they find over and over again is that every time the town wants to solve a problem, they outsource it to the county or they outsource it to the state, or they follow the regulations set by the state or the federal government. So solutions to the problems of fire protection are found in agreements with regionally organized fire districts. The town prefers to have its road signs provided in standard form. Springdale, which is the fake name for the town in the book, accepts the state's rules and regulations on roads built and maintained by the state. It works with the foreman of the state highways Maintain maintenance crew to have its teams clear village roads, thus saving the expense of organizing and paying for this as a town. State construction programs present the local political agencies with the alternative of either accepting or rejecting proposed road plans and programs formulated by the State Highway Department. And of course, most importantly for many of you today, they accept the Common Core or other such federal mandates on education. There is a pattern of dependence, they conclude, a pattern of dependence, and if you've read Lawrence Lessig's book, you know what he thinks corrupt, the definition of corruption is dependence. A pattern of dependence according to which the important decisions are made for Springdale by outside agencies, state police, Department of Education, state welfare, state highway, state conservation department. Though such agencies and their representatives are frequently resented by the community, right? We resent the federal government today. We resent the states because they're constantly telling us what to do. And yet, their services are accepted and sought because they are free, right? or because acceptance of them carries with it monetary grants and aid for the local community. They accede to the rule of these outside agencies because the agencies have the power to withhold subsidies. They're bought. Right? They sell their self-government. They sell their right to freedom to subsidies and in-kind payments. So psychologically, they conclude this dependence leads to an habituation to outside control to the point where the town and village governments find it hard to act even where they have the power. And so we give up the power over and over again. Senator Paul Douglas, who um, uh, was a leading senator for many years in the United States, had this to say. This is quoted from Republic Lost. Today, the corruption of public officials by private interests takes a more subtle form. The enticer does not generally pay money directly to the public representative. He tries instead, by a series of favors, to put the public official under such a feeling of personal obligation that the latter gradually loses his sense of mission to the public and comes to feel that his first loyalties are to his private benefactors and programs and patrons. What happens is a gradual shifting of a man's loyalties from the community to those who have been doing him favors. This is how the private, the people, corrupt the political. And we lose in that not just self-government and local governments. This is actually an important argue, argument made by a, a, a forgotten political theorist named Robert Pranger. We don't only lose local government when we lose local government. We also lose the right idea of national government. Because what does national government now do? It does the stuff that local government was supposed to do. It gives out favors. It helps people with welfare. It helps people with um, daily live things. And the true role, at least Pranger's argument, and I think he's right, of the national government was to act more as the sense of what holds different people together. Uh, there are two ideas of liberty. One is self-fulfillment, but another is idea of toleration 
of living together in a world where we don't always agree with people, but we still see ourselves as part of a common purpose. And as the government, federal government, starts to look more and more like a bank or a, a micro-regulator, it loses its ability to articulate a more general idea of what the country stands for. And so what happens? Rational voters decide not to vote, especially in local elections. In 2013, an off-year election, the New York City mayor election, not an unimportant post, some would say, drew 24% of the vote. 24. That's pretty good, actually, because in Los Angeles, it was 16. And in Durham, North Carolina, 10.9. And in Texas, municipal elections in 2013, 8.1%. Now you could say, as many people do, we need voting programs. We need to convince people to vote. They're not voting because they know it doesn't matter. And it's not because both parties are the same, although it may be. It's because municipalities and localities have over and over again given up most of their power to higher and higher entities such that they are uh, largely housekeeping organizations. Now, that's not entirely true. The New York mayor does actually have some power. But why only 24%? If you think we live in a country of self-government anymore, I mean, even voting, it's one day a year, right? And so we end with this question of corruption, the corruption of the people for our end, the corruption of the small town, uh, the small town that thinks of itself as a place of self-governments, of local habits and local customs, but is increasingly insinuated within mass society in a way that it has given up its freedom to govern itself. The corruption of politicians who become dependent upon enormous amounts of cash and thus uh, take their eye away from the common good and towards the good of those who can provide them the money they need to run. The corruption of government, which cares more about keeping itself increasingly in business than actually about solving problems. Every year, every president runs on reforming government. It never happens. Jonathan Rauch, in a great book called The End of Government, makes this case, right? That government is a bipartisan effort that wants to keep itself in business doesn't actually want to change. The corruption of the new elite, the corruption of the new poor, as Charles Murray has written about in his book, the new elite, which becomes a hollow elite, an elite that will not make judgments, that isolates itself in bubbles of privilege, but does not, uh, uh, is not willing to judge uh, others and thus abandons its public-oriented, public-spirited role. The new poor, which uh, also uh, has been uh, confined into small, isolated bubbles and has um, given up what, what, what Charles Murray calls the, the American virtues, and he'll be talking about that soon. The corruption of institutions, which uh, is a real theme of, of, of George Packer's book, uh, the, the idea that we just the institutions don't work and we don't hold them accountable because we almost don't expect them to work. The corruption of education, that's something we could talk about here uh, ad infinitum, but uh, I, if you're interested, I encourage a lot of people to read Bill Derasevitz's new book, The Excellent Sheep, um, which is a book how, uh, exactly how we corrupt people going to college. We teach them to be excellent, to be top students, to be super smart, but we don't teach them values, we don't teach them a soul in Derasevitz's word. And uh, increasingly, that's uh, become an enormous problem. And then, of course, the corruption of our moral imagination, uh, a term that David Bromwich, who will be speaking tomorrow morning, has, has, has spoken a lot about uh, how we, today, when we speak about American exceptionalism, we're often not talking about our highest values, our moral imagination, but um, justifying uh, imperialism or justifying actions that are um, that are certainly not what many of the people I've put up on the screen today would say uh, makes America great. And so we have this issue of corruption. Does that mean we're about to have two days of pessimism? 
Um, I hope not. The word corruption is itself a bulwark against temptation, separation from any criminal penalties that may attach to it. There are constant temptations to put private interests ahead of public ones. The language of corruption provides a social pressure on the other side of that equation. The point is that what we in America, maybe what makes us exceptional, is that we constantly, from the beginning, as Hannah Arendt writes, but also as Zephyr Teachout writes in her new book on corruption, from the beginning, America has been consumed with the effort to prevent democracy from being corrupted. The fact that over and over again, when it looks bleak, we come back to talk about corruption is a sign of hope. And that hope is what I hope we're going to explore over the next two days. So with that in mind, I'd like to call up the speakers for our first panel. Um, please come up and I